Hi, afternoon everyone. This is the Regulatory Services Partnership uh, webinar. We're going to be talking about uh, the retail business sector today, helping you guys understand the government rules, restrictions, um, becoming more aware of the financial and other support that's available to you. The webinar will be recorded and it will be published after the event on the council websites in each borough. All attendees other, other than the panel are muted and after the initial presentation, we'll, you guys will get a chance to ask your questions. So um, look for the virtual hands. You need to press that if you want to ask your question. When your name is said, a member of the event team will unmute you. And if you do speak, uh, it's great if you can turn your camera on. And please, uh, the other option you have is using the chat to share your views uh, or questions throughout the discussion. But we will try and, well, we will run through those and try to answer everything on uh, today. A little bit of a disclaimer at the bottom, views by any speaker or the speakers alone. You're going to hear a bit about the science and that's so the guidance from government and things that we say make a little bit more sense. You've got some context to it. The science has evolved. You know, we're in a diff very different space than where we were between March and July when we were running these webinars previously. So things are a bit different, uh, lots of changes happening. Um, so hopefully you'll find some of this helpful. So a little bit about us, the Regulated Services Partnership, RRSP, we're a council owned and managed service. We cover three boroughs. We've got over 50 staff that is all the regulatory staff you would come in contact with uh, as, uh, as a local business. And if you've never come across regulators before, uh, unfortunately, there's, there's been too many uh, stories in the media about how we are, you know, the red tape, the bureaucrats. That is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's far from the truth as it could be. We are here, uh, there's a set of laws out there, and the latest ones are these COVID rules that are now uh, on our list uh, of regulations to enforce. Like any law, we are there to give you advice, to help you guys get things right. And that's the case for 99.9% of every business we talk to about anything. It's only really businesses that are refusing to, you know, take on board those advice um, that we think about uh, taking enforcement action again. So the reason I wanted to highlight this, I've been in, in this job for 20 years. I know that is, uh, you know, fear amongst some businesses. You, you really should have no qualms at all about picking up the phone and, and uh, asking for clarity on any of your questions to uh, our, our regulators. All right. So the speakers today, myself, Paul Miloszewski-Reed, I'm from our trading standards team. We've also got Rina Purewal from our, our health and safety inspector from our environment health team. We've also got a host of other council officers from regulator and economic recovery teams to answer your questions. <clears throat> so quick overview, the science, as I say, so you've got the context, practical steps to reduce risk inside your premise, uh, talking about where you can easily access uh, and find the, the way into the government guidance, because there's lots out there. Um, touch on face coverings, visors, gloves, um, some things to think about to bring customers back because obviously just having a law that says everybody can now uh, you know open up doesn't equate to customers coming back uh, and the usual footfall that you would have experienced before the pandemic so practical steps around that and then talking about financial and other support and then there'll be a q a with the speakers at the end okay so virus in a nutshell, uh, initially we, uh, and I say we, the scientific community thought the virus is spread mostly when people cough, sneeze, therefore it's these big droplets that fall to the ground within two meters and uh, surfaces. Okay, the science has changed and, and, and updated since that. We've got 50 months more of data around the world to, to inform us. Uh, and we now know that aerosols tiny aerosols that come out when we talk and breathe is uh, a big uh, transmission risk. And the risk from uh, surfaces, what they call vomit transmission, is virtually impossible. The thinking behind that is, um, you'll recall that uh, at the beginning we were saying, uh, scientists were saying, Luke, virus can stay for three days on metal and plastic. So we all need to clean, clean, clean. 
Um, what we now know is that, uh, you know, even with particles landing on surfaces, um, within a few hours, the half the virus dies off. That's one thing. Another thing is, the whilst the virus can live in a lab for three days, that is under artificial conditions where the virus, there was a lot of virus on the surface, and two, it was kept in an aqueous solution that allowed the virus to stay alive longer, which is very different from virus particles that are coughed outside that are then um, surrounded by the air, which uh, helps uh, kill off the virus quicker. So there's been no, no reported cases of vomite transmission internationally. And uh, the reason why scientists in some center of disease government departments are saying this is virtually impossible is because you would have to have several things happen before surface transmission takes place. First, somebody would have to sneeze cough a lot on a surface. The second person would have to come along, touch that virus particles, then touch their face. Oh, and this is, they would have to touch the surface within one or two hours of the cough or sneeze. The second person gets this on their hand, they then touch their face, and fourthly, they then need to breathe in enough virus particles uh, to overwhelm their immune system. So four things need to happen that make it highly unlikely that uh, you will pick up the virus by touching surfaces. Now, why is that relevant to yourself? Well, two things mainly um, is, is, uh, will be on your mind. One is, you know, the, now the thinking is excessive cleaning is unnecessary. You know, just having your normal hygiene, hand washing, and your normal day-to-day -day cleaning of surfaces is enough to deal with bacteria and virus generally. Offering things like magazines in waiting areas uh, or drinks, in terms of retailers, um, you know, some retailers, you know, initially we were having conversations about how long do we take clothes um, off? Do we put them in quarantine almost once somebody's touched that clothing or touched different things on shelves? Do we need to then take them all off the shelves and keep them off for two, three days? So that is uh, not necessary. Now, you know, the, the risk is negligible to, to, uh, to, to, to zero of uh, transmission in that way. So hopefully that will save time and efforts for you to focus on the things that are important. Um, again, more context, outdoors, the risk is very low. This is because virus aerosols are diluted so quickly uh, in the air, it doesn't pose a risk. So one of the SAGE government advisors said even scenarios like crowded beaches are low risk. 90% um, of the virus is killed off within seven minutes of sunlight. Why is that relevant to retailers? Because previous businesses have asked us, okay, if sunlight kills, um, why don't I buy one of those UV light sterilizers and have those placed around the premise to kill off the virus inside the premise? There is a lot of scams online and UV sterilizers are included amongst those. You cannot buy on the market today any UV light sterilizer that you could put up above people's heads um, that is safe because whilst it kills the virus, it also is dangerous to uh, humans. Uh, so uh, don't buy those. Now that is completely different from the likes of UV sterilizers that you get in hairdressers because that is a closed you know, metal cabinet that doesn't cause those same risks to the customer staff in the, in the premise. Um, now, why is outdoors relevant to yourselves? Well, um, this is because of this thinking about the difference between indoor and outdoor risk. This is why you've seen things like al fresco dining and discussions around having people sit or wait or queue outdoors because the, the less time they're indoors, the, the more you're uh, choosing the risk. Um, for some sectors, there was things like pavement licenses to make it easier for people to, to queue outdoors. Uh, some, some councils went further than that and enclosed parts of roads uh, completely or partially to make it easier for people to use outdoors. 
uh, that is something that you can talk to with, with your own council. Now, whilst we cover three London boroughs, this webinar is going online. So you may be based in an area outside uh, of our area. Every council will have different um, uh, rules and ability to do this sort of thing, depending on a whole range of factors uh, that they need to consider when, when they close their roads. But it's worth having those conversations if, if that's something that you think is would help your business. Now, there's a lot of guidance out there. It's uh, so many different sector guides and each sector pretty much has their own guide. However, some uh, for many businesses, you might have to look at three or four different guides to get the full picture of everything that's relevant to your business. So to make that easier for you to figure out what you should be uh, reading, this link here I uh, found very useful. You just answer five, six questions about the type of business, how many employees, and they will, they will direct you to the guidance relevant for yourself. Um, the other thing to just highlight is um, some of these guides allow you to download the guide. But that's beneficial because in the PDF format, you also get tick box checklists that can make it easier for you to go through the guide and make sure you've followed everything in there. The other thing to be mindful of is your trade association. So that may be BIRA or BRC. Um, also, um, I'm not sure if they do their own guidance, but what I found doing these talks to all sectors is that most of the time each trade association has their own guidance or their own FEQs, or they try and provide as much information, making it freely available to members and non-members to help them understand the rules, understand what financial support is available. So do look at BRC and BIRA uh, websites as well. Risk assessment, my colleague will touch on that later. So indoors. Um, Reducing the risk indoors, good ventilation is the priority. Now, um, lots of studies being done around this over the years, because you know, uh, COVID-19 uh, isn't the first time there's been airborne diseases. These have been around in different types of diseases for you know over 10 years. And there's the scientific community have uh, come across some really useful information that's helped inform policy. Uh, this one uh, I found quite helpful, one of the ones that Sage quote, um, about a, a study that looked at a tuberculosis, so another out airborne uh, virus, uh, airborne disease, in a university, and it had very poor ventilation inside, and just by changing the ventilation to improving it, they decreased the risk by 97%. Yeah, so they decreased the amount of transmission 97% just by ensuring there was good ventilation. Now, you cannot, with a bit of equipment, go into a shop and say, okay, this is how many virus particles are in the air. Yeah, there isn't a bit of equipment that I'm aware of that allows you to do that. But what you can do is you can measure the level of CO2. So that's the amount of carbon dioxide that customer staff breathe out. And that is a very good indicator of whether you have good ventilation in your premise. So when you see, uh, if you've got CO2 levels below this thousand parts per million, that is uh, good ventilation. Uh, so this is something that you can test uh, if you wanted to just by uh, buying a, an off the shelf carbon dioxide monitor. Um, you, some councils may provide this. So councils uh, have uh, you know, um, teams that go out and do air quality tests. So depending on which council area you're in, you can have conversations with them, whether they're able to check that when they're going out and doing their visits. Um, other than using equipment, you know, obviously we get questions about, well, how many windows, doors do we need to open? What does peak ventilation look like? Um, how do we improve ventilation? You know, usually just taking basic steps of, you know, opening windows and doors as much as you can thinking about how you improve the flow of ventilation through the property. So sometimes opening all the windows at the front of the premise doesn't do anything because of the position 
that your building is and, and other buildings around you. So you may need to think about air conditioning. You may need to consider um, uh, fans. Yeah, and there is uh, there is a guide a guide that I circulate in the follow up information, which will go through that in more detail for you. Uh, mitigation. This caused confusion with some businesses, and I still, you know, in talking businesses today, I can see there's still some confusion around, you know, what does one meter plus mean? What are mitigation factors? So, again, the context is relevant, so you understand uh, these measures, and it allow you to make better decisions in your own premise. So, there's there's two main things that you need to think about that um, in terms of the risk. Trans transmitting an airborne virus between different people. One is viral load. So simply standing next to somebody for, you know, next to somebody for uh, a period of time and they're one or two meters away and they might have COVID-19 does not mean to say automatically that that passes to you. You need to breathe in enough of those virus particles to overwhelm your own immune system. And there's loads of factors that affect obviously individuals immune systems. Um, and also time is a, is a factor. So the longer you are in a space with someone or in a space that's not been ventilated and somebody's breathed out those particles, the longer you're in that space, um, the higher the, the risk is of uh, breathing in sufficient uh, virus particles to overwhelm your system. So this is why you, um, this is why you see in the case of gyms, when there's a whole conversation about people going to gyms can't wear face coverings. So what do we do to mitigate risk in the, those areas? SAGE and Public Health England looked at that sector and they said, if you have slightly better ventilation than that 1,000 per, uh, parts per million, that is sufficient for you to avoid users wearing face coverings. Uh, again, the detail will be in the follow-up. But there, that was a sector where lots of people heavily breathing, no face coverings being worn, but the risk was minimized to such an extent by good ventilation. So that is something that you think about in terms of aerosols. So you have people talking, breathing out. Ventilation and uh, face coverings. For large droplets, this is where people cough, sneeze, you're thinking slightly differently. Um, uh, sorry, just to put that in a bit of context. So for aerosols, if you're in a room, say it's a 10 meter by 10 meter room, if that space is unventilated, it's irrelevant whether you're two meters, eight meters or 10 meters away from the other person inside that room. If you're in a room with somebody that's got COVID-19 and you're there for you know several hours, it would not matter you're two meters away because you're breathing in enough of the particles breathed out by the other person that it could potentially overwhelm your immune system. I hope that makes sense, but obviously ask for clarity around this at the end if, if it doesn't. Now with large droplets where you cough or sneeze, that is different because you need to be near enough somebody for those droplets to come into contact with the other person rather than them drop to the ground or surfaces. And that's where seat configuration is important. So you might have, you know, retail premise. So for example, retail premise like Boots, it's got some seats near the pharmacy because generally elderly people can't stand up. They want to uh, allow them to sit down. So you would configure your seats in such a way that people are sitting side by side or they're back to back. You would think about this in terms of checkout tills for supermarkets, how people are positioned. Um, where you cannot use those mitigating factors, ventilation, effective face coverings, then you're falling back on screens for, uh, you know, large droplets. Yeah. But screens, as you've seen, you don't have screens around every gym. Screens are not, uh, you know, an absolute imperative. It completely depends on the, the setup of your place, ventilation and a host of other factors. Um, that's the uh, guidance I mentioned, just to highlight two things. If you've got any basements, rooms that are poorly ventilated, the guidance says don't allow two members of staff to work in there for more than 30 minutes because of heightened risk. Give special consideration to toilets because typically they will not have um, 
windows, uh, therefore there's a, a heightened risk with those spaces. Uh, with PPE, um, as I mentioned, um, speech aerosols, just by people talking is a risk. So uh, there was a bit of confusion around whether you could wear a face shield instead of a face covering. The, the reason why the advice said no, because if you only wore a face shield, it doesn't, whilst it's great if somebody coughs or sneezes, it doesn't stop the tiny particles coming out and around from that um, face shield. Plus, for the wearer, it doesn't avoid, stop them breathing in particles that are floating around the air. Uh, you'll get this in the follow-up information, but just to highlight, face coverings, there's a huge difference in their efficacy. Things like scarves, almost no protection because it's uh, got big holes in it, whereas very tightly woven fabrics cannot, uh, can stop uh, you know, over 80% of large virus particles being breathed out. Um, staff testing. So this has been a, a question, you know, do you need to test staff? How often do you test staff? Things like this. What kind of test should we, we be looking at? So uh, for employees, well, anybody can uh, sign up to the government site and get um, tests set out for themselves. Employers could order test kits as well. Um, those are available from the government site that will get circulated um, in the follow-up information. Um, bear in mind what I said earlier about, in terms of thinking what test to buy, because you can buy PCR tests or LFT tests yourselves. Um, viral load is uh, a good indicator of how infectious somebody is. So somebody having COVID-19, for, for most people, 99.95% .95 of people who catch COVID-19, uh, you will, you know, there won't be serious consequences. Uh, and for a majority of those people, um, they won't display symptoms, and, you know, they might not even realize they've got it. So it's um, how much virus is inside yourself um, is, is a factor, you know, that, that determines how much of a risk you are to spreading it to other staff and customers. The PCR test is great if you want a yes, no answer. It, it's very, very sensitive. Um, however, the downside of that is it may pick up um, somebody that has ver barely any virus inside them. Um, there, some scientists have suggested it picks up even fragments of the virus. So you might've had the virus a long time ago. You, you were immune to it, your body you know, dealt with it, but those particles are still inside. Um, and to give you an indication of how highly sensitive it was, some tests by um, different authorities in another country found that 90% of the people that tested positive for the PCR test um, had so little virus inside that it was, it was unlikely that they were a risk of transmitting it to other people. This is why the likes of World Health Organization have been um, uh, given advice on uh, towards pointing people towards lateral flow tests because it's more likely to detect the positive cases when the viral load is at the highest. Yeah, so that's so many days before symptoms, so many days after symptoms. Um, this is some of the other support that we got asked to talk about. Uh, you know, it goes well. Before the pandemic, every year, one in four of us experienced some sort of mental health problem. This is, this is when life was normal. Um, you know, many um, uh, of the mental health charities talk about the UK suffering from a mental health epidemic. There's lots of information, loads of surveys being done over the last 15 months that paint a very worrying picture. Um, you know, if, and this is everybody from children to young adults, uh, people experiencing feelings of loneliness, hopelessness. Um, you know, we're all social creatures. You know, it's not normal for us to be locked up. It has, uh, you know, serious effects on our mental health. That's obviously relevant to yourselves as employers because you have people, uh, you know, who are working for you. Now, in, a, in one survey, just under half of employees said their mental health uh, had worsened during the outbreak. 
but that was um, a serve, I, kind of, I call it a work survey. It was for a work um, employer trade association. So that's half of people saying that. Now, the thing to bear in mind, if you do your own internal work surveys, a lot of people will not feel comfortable telling their employer that they um, are concerned about their own mental health because they're worried how that will, how they'll be viewed. Um, so even if you say it's, it's anonymous, bear that in mind. I would direct you to look at the uh, surveys that have been done outside of a work context. So different surveys showing around 80% of men suffering from uh, depression, anxiety, etc. Men are, you know, we're really bad. We never like to talk to anybody about mental health. So, the, you know, we are seen as a much higher risk than women. 90% of working mums in a survey done by a union. So this is 50,000 mums, so quite significant statistically. Now, most working mums said their mental health had been negatively impacted. So these are the people that come into work, back to work for you. These are the people that may be working at home in some way uh, for you. Half of them are anxious about returning to the workplace. Uh, many will have job insecurity fears. Now, what they found, you know, might seem common sense is, you know, consulting with your staff, just talking to them, ideally letting them input and give feedback into um, how to make the workplace safe. Uh, because there is a huge difference between what you do to make people safe. So you may do everything right to make your workplace safe. But if you don't communicate that in the right way with staff, and even if you don't, you know, even so far as if you don't involve them in the process, it can still mean that there's a lot of anxiety amongst your employees, which is going to lead to problems of staff not being as productive as you like. Um, you are, you know, uh, it, you know, you are one of these people that probably got even more stressed than employees because you are trying to run a business. You're trying, you know, you have been affected by these lockdowns. You've been affected by a huge drop in footfall. And even when retail was reopened, footfall didn't increase. There's a lot of fear out there amongst your potential customers. It'll take a long time for people to get back to normal. There is a whole you know, there is a whole side of it as well that now people have got used to doing things online. How many of them will ever go back to high street uh, purchasing? So I'm sure all of these things are going through your mind, which has got to be, uh, you know, affecting your mental health. And we've all got our own worries as well about family and friends. So I say these things because, you know, we're very conscious this, of this as individuals, as well as regulators talking to businesses and hearing these concerns. So you know, a little bit of context to put things in, um, it, have some perspective. Yes, the virus is a problem and there's steps happening to deal with that, but not much has changed from what we were told at the very beginning, that it is something that will affect the vulnerable, the elderly, or those with underlying health conditions. And that's born now after a year of, uh, you know, year of data now. Most, the average person dying from COVID is 82 and a half years old. The average life expectancy in the UK is 81. So, you know, it is predominantly affecting the elderly. Um, so 99.9% .9 of everyone of all ages um, is unlikely to suffer, have any serious consequences of catching COVID. When you look at the under 70s, um, the, you know, the amount uh, is, you know, very, very, very small, not point not. Uh, one or not point not two the very small risk um, of serious consequences to the under 70s and now the over 70s have been vaccinated you could say you know the typical customer coming into your premise is you know a low uh, risk um 500 odd people of working age under the age of 60 without underlying health conditions um, died during the March till January. So again, the, the figures, the facts bear out that we are, you know, we are bearing out what the scientists said at the very beginning. Unfortunately, um, here in a year of fear in the media paints a, a very different picture. So just bear in mind that perspective, that context. In terms of uh, the follow-up information, there'll be a lot of info, um, apps, contacts, groups, things to think about in terms of for yourself or um, your uh, employees. And, and also not just the employees, those employees will may have family. So 
you know, think about the wider picture of how you're dealing with employees and, and, and what's, you know, the problems that they're going through and concerns that they have. Everybody will have these same fears and, and, and suffering in terms of their mental health as well. Okay, um, vaccination is, is another thing that's been coming up. Some businesses um, saying we are, we're thinking about changing our, uh, you know, requiring all their employees to get vaccinated. Uh, before they come back to work. Some sectors uh, like cinemas, you know, talking out loud, will we have days for people that have been vaccinated and other days for people that haven't been vaccinated? So these are real questions that are going on in businesses' minds and you may be having the same thoughts uh, yourself uh, about what you do going forward. Um, so two things to bear in mind here, you know, a survey of some 70,000 people, around 20 to 30 percent of uh, young to adults and, and adults said they've they thought it's very unlikely they'd get the vaccine. So there's still a uh, uh, fear and doubts or for whatever reason they don't want to get the vaccine. Some of those people may be your staff. So that's one thing to bear in mind. Um, so any thoughts of, you know, thinking of doing a mandatory staff vaccination program? I direct you to the ACAS advice. Uh, essentially, there is things to think about, like you know, human rights issues, discrimination. It may conflict with uh, certain uh, laws, um, and that's a similar thing in terms of any policy uh, of making it mandatory to customers. There's concerns, possible conflict with discrimination rules. Now, this is something that's being considered nationally. So government did a two week public consultation. It ended just the other week um, uh, where they're thinking about the ethical and legal ramifications of forcing uh, everyone or forcing people in certain jobs to have the vaccine or to prove they are um, immune. This is something that's been considered a national basis. So I would say, you know, hold fire. Uh, to develop any of your own policies and we'll wait to see what comes out of that. Oh, sorry, was passed there. And what I'm going to come back to that. So I will pass you over to Ravina, who will talk a bit uh, uh, about risk assessment, etc. And I'll come back to that slide, which is some of the questions that we got posed in advance. We've got maybe 10, 15 minutes less uh, more of us chatting. And then it's going to be over to yourself to ask any of your questions. So again, raise the hand if you want to talk at the end of this or um, put your question in the chat and we'll cover it at the end. All right. Um, so hi, my name is Ravina Porowal and I work as an environmental health officer in, within the RSP. So I'll be covering a few points um, about risk assessments like, like Paul mentioned and then we'll um, lead into the question and answer session. So to start with the risk assessments, as an employer, you have a legal responsibility to protect workers and others from risk to their health and safety, including from the risks posed by COVID-19. So you should treat COVID-19 as a hazard in the workplace, just like you would treat other hazards, such as slips, trips and falls or working from height. So, and it should be managed and COVID-19 should be managed the same way as these hazards. So this, in, this includes completing a suitable and sufficient assessment of the risks of COVID-19, so a COVID-19 risk assessment. If you have more than five employees, you must record the findings of your risk assessment. And if you have fewer than five employees, there's no legal requirement for you to record your findings, but you might find it helpful to have something written down. There's a lot of guidance available online about risk assessments. Um, the links here are to the Health and Safety Executive website provides a lot of guidance um, and also um, on the Merton Council website, we have a template risk assessment you might wish to use. Um, next slide, please, Paul. Um, so this is a particular document on the HSE website, um, the Health and Safety Executive, which is titled What to Include in Your COVID-19 Risk Assessment. So it provides a lot of examples, and I've just copied an example here for you. So, um, so the hazard it's talking about here, there's various different ones, but the one in particular in this screenshot is getting or spreading coronavirus by not washing hands or not washing them adequately. So you should think of that hazard, then you should think what can I do to control it? Um, so 
the, 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 there's various examples here. So making sure that you've got enough wash and basins at the premises, which are provided with hot water, soap and hygienic hand drying facilities. You're providing posters on how to wash hands properly and displaying the posters and providing hand sanitizer for occasions when people can't wash their hands. Um, and then what further action do you need to control these risks? So, for example, going round every morning and checking that the hand sanitizer stations and the soap is all topped up. And as mentioned, um, talking about signage and things. So I really do recommend you referring to this document when producing your risk assessments. Um, next slide, please. So now we're talking about the NHS test and trace slash QR codes. So um, we had an earlier webinar for the close contact services for the beauty industry. So, so, so I'll only go through some of the sentences which are relevant to this re webinar. So retail, oh, there's, oh, it's only a legal requirement for betting shops to display an NHS QR, QR, QR code poster like the one pictures, pictured. Other shops and branches do not need to maintain records of customers to support NHS test and trace. So for example, you don't have to go and scan a code when you go and do your weekly shop at Sainsbury's or anything like that. It would only be if you were if you were a betting shop. Next slide, please. So in case there are any betting shops on this uh, webinar, I'll, I'll just cover this briefly. Um, you, as, alongside, alongside displaying the QR code poster, you must, you must ask every customer or visitor age 16 and over to check into your venue. Um, so they can either check in using, the, if they've got the NHS COVID-19 app on their phone, they will scan the NHS QR code poster. However, if for any reason they don't have a smartphone or they don't wish to use the NHS COVID-19 app or their battery might have died, you must have a system in place to ensure you can collect you can still collect this information from customers. So, for example, you could have a, a diary which you write it in or you could get them to fill out a, a little slip which you keep in a folder or something like that. And then you must keep this data for 21 days and provide it to NHS Test and Trace if requested. But as a reminder, that is just for betting shops only, as this is the retail webinar. Um, for any other retail shops on there, so clothing shops, uh, off licenses, and anything like that that's on the core, that wouldn't apply to you but what you do still need to do is keep a record of all staff working at your premises and their shift times and then their contact details in case NHS Test and Trace needs to contact them. Next slide please. I want to just skip this one as well. So face covering. So by law staff and customers of retail settings are required to wear a face covering unless they have an exemption. In addition to that, by law, businesses must remind people to wear face coverings where they are required to. So this could be done using signage or you could have a member of staff working at the, the front of the premises reminding customers. Um, so employers must ensure, so it's a legal requirement for staff to wear the face coverings. So they must ensure that staff in retail settings wear face coverings when they are in areas that are open to the public or where they are likely to come within close contact of a member of the public unless they have an exemption. So if you're working in the back in the warehouse, which is not open to the which is not open to customers, there's no legal requirement for you to wear a face covering in that area. Um, if businesses have taken steps to create a physical barrier or screen between workers and members of the public, then staff behind the barrier or screen will not be required to wear a face covering. So you might have seen this at some of the checkouts in the supermarkets. Um, and there's, there's been a lot of queries. I think I've seen a couple in this chat about exemptions and also in our previous webinar. So if customers are exempt and they come in and tell you I'm exempt, there's no legal requirement for them to show any kind of proof of their exemption. There's no exemption card system. It's all voluntary. So if somebody says I'm exempt, then you have to take it as, at face value and um, take it that they're exempt and let them into the premises. Um, you should not refuse anybody entry based on that because that's going into the um, different types of going into discrimination and all that relevant legislation. In terms of staff being exempt, as part of your risk assessment, you should identify staff that are exempt and what you can do to protect them. So if you think going back to the supermarket example and you've got the self checkout, so staff working in that area, um, there's no kind of screens or barriers that can work behind the they're coming in contact with members of the public. So 
you wouldn't want somebody who cannot wear a face covering to work in that area. Instead, you could maybe have them in a different role, so working at the back of house or working behind a screen or barrier. And any staff that are exempt, there's no legal requirement for this, but I do advise that they wear some sort of badge which advise, advises customers. This just makes customers feel a little bit safer and also prevents us from getting complaint from getting unnecessary complaints, really. Um, next slide, please. Um, and this is just a picture of the staying secure, staying COVID-19 secure and um, poster, which is on the government website. So if you if you go on to the website, find this poster, there's five steps. It starts with risk assessment. Then the next step is um, having clean hand cleaning, hand washing and hygiene procedures in line with the guidance. If you feel that you've gone through all five steps, you can sign it off and display this at the front of your premises to make customers um, feel more comfortable coming into the shop. Next slide, please. This is just some photographs of the, um, it's a better photograph. So as you can see, this business has got this sign up, but you can't see it very clearly. So you'd want it in a, a prominent position so customers can see when entering the premises that you are taking the right measures. Um, and you can also, this probably wouldn't apply as much because not many of you would have websites, um, like a, a small um, grocery store. I can't imagine you having a, a big website. Um, but if you do have any kind of online you could have Instagram pages, you can post things on there about the steps you're taking. So for example, reduce capacity, heightened cleaning. Um, you can even post your risk assessment online if you wish to. Um, and you've got the, you could even, it's no legal requirement to do so, but you could ask customers for feedback post their visit if you could do anything else to make them feel more comfortable. Next slide, please. And um, although financial support is not our area of expertise, um, I'll pop post speaking I'll post the links in the chat and um, so there's a link to the government website here which you can go on which talks about the financial support but I'll also post the links to the Merton Richmond and Wandsworth websites which talks about um, all the grants and loans and everything like that next slide please I think that's that's me done but I'll pass back to Paul yeah lovely thanks very much Ravina um let's pop back uh have a look at this um okay this is some questions we've done two webinars today um uh, looking at this i think this is just all the ones that were relevant to close contact yes um okay so what i'll start to do now is um we're going to pass it i think that's everything we were going to cover we're going to pass it over to yourself to ask any questions so two ways of doing that um at the moment you everybody's muted so you can um raise your hand and then when your name is called you'll be unmuted to ask your question um if you do speak great if you can turn your camera on um meanwhile whilst you're thinking about your questions i will run through the ones that we've got uh, so far in the chat um is there any chance of getting recording yes this has been recorded and re uh, recording will be made available on the three council websites richmond martin and wandsworth um it should be up certainly on the richmond one by monday uh, and all three we'd hope within you know seven to ten ten days um secondly there will be a follow-up document because uh, I appreciate we're going through a lot of information. There's a lot of detail here. You don't need to memorize all this, thankfully. You're going to get a follow-up uh, document which will give you the detail on any of this. If you want to get do a deep dive in aerosol transmission, efficacy of face coverings, or uh, the links to this, support, mental health, anything that we've mentioned today, you'll be able to get uh, a lot more detailed information in that paper. And um, yeah, that's about it. So we'll start to go through the, the chat questions. Is there a recommended airflow rate for the retail sector? Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll talk about in the detail information, it'll talk to you in terms of how many liters per minute or second it is. Um, so you can look at that to, uh, you know, then refer that to your air conditioning um, engineer.
Um, P.S. Fans only recirculate the air. Right. So, uh, yeah, that's a good point. There's no point just having uh, a fan um, or an air con unit that is simply on recirculation mode. Yeah, if you just recirculate and move the same existing air around the premise, you're not doing anything to dilute the virus particles that are breathed out by people. So it needs to be a, a fresh air supply that comes in. And that can be done in many ways, windows, doors, fans, but whatever ways you, you can find in your premise to allow fresh air to come in and out. Uh, one of the questions, no, no mention yet of treating conditioned air in retail spaces. Will that be covered? I, I hope I've uh, now picked up uh, on that question as well by what I've just said. Um, I'm genuinely be told, I think this is the one around the face coverings. I regularly been told people are exempt. So my colleagues already picked up this point about customers coming in saying they're exempt. Um, will training standards be checking the maintenance of air con systems in the future? Uh, that is not something that's on our uh, on our list of things to do. Um, but, you know, we, we represent three councils and, and this webinar is going to be online, so it, you may be a business space somewhere else. Um, councils, and there's two things you can do, uh, really. Uh, you know, one thing you can do in terms of knowing whether you've got good ventilation is by uh, a carbon dioxide monitor. Yeah, you remember I mentioned low carbon dioxide equals good ventilation levels. So carbon dioxide levels uh, or monitors are available um, online. I am aware that some of them, I think can get a bit expensive, uh, you know, 100, 150 pounds or something. So I can understand that may seem uh, expensive. The other option is, um, is, you know, do discuss with your local authority. Some councils have, uh, you know, um, uh, teams that do uh, tests that have equipment that can do um, uh, carbon dioxide and, and lots of checks on other pollutants in, in the air. So it may be that they can do a program. I think it's something we were doing for schools at some point. So it may be something that can uh, be requested of councils and can be looked into. Um, and failing that, uh, those two aside, uh, you know, the, the, the roughest, uh, you know, practical thing you can do is the old wet finger test where, you know, you can, you wet your finger and you can feel a gentle breeze going through the premise after you've opened the windows and doors, then that is a, you know, really rough uh, indicator that the, you have, you know, decent ventilation in the premise. Um, I appreciate that if you have not got aircon system and engineers, you, know, you might be a very small shop. Uh, some of these things are very difficult to do. But um, just to uh, give you some uh, context, uh, something that can maybe help you understand what we mean by good ventilation better. There was some uh, test done by local authority where they went into local pubs and, um, uh, and a gym and um, uh, a few pubs and or massage uh, places as well. And, and those places that generally had a process of keeping some windows and doors in had good ventilation. The, the two, two premises that were of concern were both in places where the windows, one pub, all the windows and doors were shut all the time, except when people came in. So they had a very high, uh, uh, carbon dioxide, very poor ventilation. And another one teaching uh, young children also kept the doors and windows closed. Uh, only opened them very infrequently and that was during the winter period. And again, poor ventilation there. But the other premises that were checked out, um, the ventilation was uh, at a good level. So it's not, the thing I want to get across, it's not difficult to have a good level of ventilation in most premises where you've got access to open windows and doors. Um, questions around uh, masks. 
you know, uh, somebody saying, yes, it is true that N95 and FFP3 masks, the medical grade masks are the best in terms of offering protection to, uh, from breathing in virus particles that are in the air. Um, governments always said, you, you know, those are unnecessary. Those are, those are unnecessary for anybody unless you're in, uh, you know, people in medical sort of high risk environments. Um, and the other thing you'll see when you get the efficacy or face covering information is that if you have um, a tightly woven material like 100% cotton and two layers of that, some of those even hand homemade masks can offer something in the region of 85% plus um, uh, filtration in terms of breathing out particles. And you, now you will be aware that for months uh, during last year, um, the, the worry was, well, that only helps you stopping breathing out particles to everybody around you. It doesn't offer any protection to the wearer. There was, again, the information, you know, is uh, limited at this stage, but there was one study that looked at um, nurses in another country that wore um, uh, fabric face coverings. So none of these high grade medical grade masks. And they found that the nurses that wore the, the fabric face coverings were less likely to catch the virus themselves than those that didn't wear it. That is only one study, um, but uh, you know, it's the only one that's available. They, they, they suggested there might be some level of protection to the wearer as well from a, a well-fitted uh, double uh, uh, mask. So the detail of that is in the follow-up, if you want to get into that. Um, the other thing that's been pointed out by one of my colleagues is there is huge fraud online, uh, and this epidemic is no uh, different. People are selling fake and misdescribed uh, face coverings, uh, face coverings are ineffective, classing it as being sold as PPE, HEPA filters, I've already mentioned the UV lights. So there's lots of fraudsters around the world uh, setting up scam websites or selling this stuff on online marketplaces. And, and it's worth just highlighting online marketplaces, although some of the global big players are big reputable businesses themselves, they don't have the facility or resource uh, or legal obligation to check um, that all the products uh, being sold on their platforms are legal. Um, so please don't assume because it's on a, a reputable site that it, it has been tested or checked by anyone. Um, next question, can you get a test to determine what level of immunity you have acquired? Um, after having taken the vaccine. So there is um, antigen tests which look at whether you've got, and I'm not going to say this in the, in the, using the right medical scientific words, but it effectively checks uh, things inside your body to check you've got a certain level of immunity. Um, there, is, there is also information out there from within the scientific community saying, um, bear in mind this is the second uh, coronavirus of this family. We have experienced another one previously, uh, and there is links also to relationships of other, uh, uh, corona, uh, other coronavirus related families. So there is uh, some information out there to say that there is a certain level of immunity already within the population. And bear in mind what I said earlier on about, you know, 99.95% of everyone of every age will have no serious um, illness it, when they catch this. And that's for every age. Um, but when you look at the under 70s, so, you know, everybody from young all the way up to 70, the risk is, uh, uh, you know, not 0.01 or 0.02% um, risk of death to people in that age group of uh, dying of uh, if you catch uh, coronavirus. So although, and this is perfectly natural after a year or 15 months of us 
you know, seeing all these numbers and uh, in the news for a long time, it's perfectly natural that a lot of us are, uh, you know, have those fears. Um, but it is worth bearing in mind the context, which unfortunately you don't get from the media because sensationalize themselves, as we know. Um, but in terms of <clears throat> things haven't changed from what we were told initially, which is if you are not elderly and vulnerable, if you haven't got an underlying health condition, you're at very low risk. Um, the latest data says that up until January 2021, 20, uh, that um, 560 uh, people without uh, underlying conditions who were on, uh, below uh, 60, I think it was, uh, died. So all the data supports everything we were told at the beginning, but unfortunately, you know, we've had a, a year of uh, uh, further down the line um, where the fear has increased as this has went on. Um, so keep that in mind that that's I'm saying those things because obviously some people are really concerned when they thought of an individual walking into the store that's not wearing a face covering. Remember what I said earlier, it's about how long in a typical retail setting, somebody's in there for a very small amount of time. Um, if your ventilation is good, like similar to a gym where nobody wears face coverings, you know, if you look at it in the hole, um, it is, uh, you know, the, the level of risk is, is fairly low in looking at all the context of, of that, that sort of scenario. If a staff member tests positive in a retail store, what is the expected protocol for the owner? Um, is this something you'd like to answer, Ravina, and also pick up the question around, um, there's another question around immunity, I think it was, just above that. Oh yeah, I'll, um, I'll try and answer this to the best of my ability. So in terms of the question about what to do if a member of staff tests positive, so if you've just got one member of staff testing positive, um, then you should, they should be isolating for the 10 days um, and you should identify any potential close contacts in the workplace. I'll put the link to this, um, to the guidance in the chat once I've spoken. Um, which defines what a close contact would be. Various things, for example, if they shared a car or vehicle coming into work um, and being in direct face-to-face -face contact for more than a minute, I think it is, um, they would be determined to be a close contact, so they would need to isolate as well. And that was if you just have one case. If you had two or more cases within a 14-day period, that would be what we call an outbreak. So I put the, copied and pasted the relevant section of the guidance into the um, chat and it says that if you believe you've had an outbreak of COVID-19 at your workplace you should co contact your local health protection team and there's also a link in the chat to um, where you just put in put in your postcode and you'll find out the contact you does for your local health protection team and you should call them and you should work with them and they will um, they will provide you with all the information about outbreak, outbreak management processes and anything you need to do, any kind of com control measures you need to take, like a deep clean. They'll help you with all that. Um, but the main main thing to do is to contact them really if you've got an outbreak. But for a single case, um, then identify any close contacts and they all should be isolating. Um, and then the next question, sorry, what was that, Paul? I think I've missed it. Yeah, you. sorry, no, I've already answered the one above that. Um, uh, I didn't read it uh, clearly in the, the way the chats appear. So that's fine. That's great. Thank you. Um, we had another question about changing rooms. Um, sorry, can I just double check? I am. Yes, I need it. So changing rooms, will they be open? Yes, change rooms, you can open them. Um, again, just think about ventilation. Uh, you don't need to be getting worried about quarantine and clothes. You know, those were kind of things we were thinking and, and concerns and queries. We had from closed retailers a year ago. We now know, uh, you know, that's not necessary now. So it's about keeping the ventilation uh, good in those areas. If you have uh, poor ventilation in that area, think thinking about, uh, you know, some period of time in between people. Um, bear in mind that they will be wearing a face covering, so that reduces the, you know, everybody going in there is wearing face coverings. So in theory, the risk, even in an unventilated changing room area, it has been lowered already by that mitigation uh, measure. 
Um, and, and, you know, most people will be in that area for a very small, you know, period of time, 10, 15 minutes or, or so. So again, when we think about time is a factor and ventilation, when you look at the context, um, even if you cannot ventilate the room very well, you shouldn't really be having to get into things like thinking about having, you know, 10, 20 minute breaks between different customers. That probably is unnecessary for the, the minimum risk that is in that uh, particular kind of scenario. Ho question about hospitality venues. Uh, my colleagues mentioned there will be a hospitality focused webinar tomorrow at 2.30. So that will get into the detail uh, of everything hospitality related, including the QR codes for them. Does the face covering include a visor? Um, no, it does not. Um, my slide mentions this, and again, it will be in the detail. Face visor, bear, face visors are great in terms of coughing and sneezing when it's large droplets, because the visor in front of the face catches those. But for small aerosols that you breathe in or breathe out when you're talking or, or breathing, it doesn't offer any protection uh, to the wearer, only uh, face coverings potentially, if well fitted and a certain material, offer some sort of um, protection from the um, smaller aerosols. Um, next question is, uh, Oh, I think we've got um, a member with a hand up, Joanna Buckmaster. Yeah. So I've just asked her to unmute. Can I just say that name again, Joanna? I have unmuted. Can you hear me? Excellent. Hi, we can hear Hello. I don't know if you want to see me, but I'm not quite sure how to do that. Don't, don't worry. No worries. Okay, um, I've got two questions which are sort of linked. Um, I'm a retail, but I've got a bit of leisure. Um, I run a, a, the equivalent for cakes of a pottery cafe. So I have retail at the front and I sell cakes. And at the back, I have a workshop where I teach children's parties and adult workshops. So I'm, I've been receiving support through being retail because I think my retail is slightly a larger area than my um, what I call leisure. Um, but it puts... Uh, there's two questions really one is for the um things i need to put in place should i decide to open and at the moment i'm not because it's too complicated um would the measures i need to put in place for the teaching and parties area be the close contact measures um because obviously i have a larger number of people in a small proximity from different households and a lot of them being children, it's really hard to teach. In fact, it's impossible to teach from two meters. Um, yeah. So that, <clears throat> that, okay. that, that's the main one. And the other one slightly related to that is, and I don't know if I missed some of this because I had a customer in the middle of the webinar, but I noticed the restart grant for retail um, is divided, it's, it, it's separated from uh, leisure. Um, I was told originally that I wasn't part of leisure for support um, but looking at the government guidance it appears I now am but the um, the hospitality um, seems to be getting a larger restart grant and I wondered is that because they can't go back yet properly because they have to operate on a limited basis and how does that fit in with me not being able to restart my classes and workshops sorry lots okay. of stuff there so, uh, yeah, it, I think what you're talking about is hospitality uh, and a number of other businesses were offered up to 18,000 yeah, and yeah. non-essential non retail were offered 6,000. Am I right in saying that? Yes. Roughly. So there's a, a, a big difference. Uh, and the question is, why is that? Um, if you look at what's happened the past year, uh, hospita um, hospitality is... Uh, well, actually, non-essential retail. 
actually, I might be wrong in that. In honesty, I was about to say hospitality has been closed a lot more. That was my my initial feeling. Um, and uh, is one thing on whether their costs were were slightly higher. Yeah. So I can't answer that easily because no. I was getting confused with. Re I was thinking for a moment there retail where well, retail haven't been closed as much. But no, well we've been non-essential retail closed but open for click and collect. But hospitality yes. includes the cafe opposite, who's been closed but open for takeaway. Yeah, yeah. So actually yeah. we're compatible with them. Yeah. Well, I, I think I think when you look at it, um I, I, I'm just guessing here, but after I've heard loads of concerns about hospitality over the year, uh, and what they're saying is that uh generally click and collect was nowhere near coming near the income they were getting in i do i do appreciate that retail and e-commerce is in a similar boat um it might just be that they've made one that made the argument stronger to government uh the, the retail were not essential retail what they're going to do or it might be that government i'm sure they've analyzed the cost in both sectors and that's why they've come around to these figures so yeah. In so, terms of getting you a better answer, yeah, uh, I think that is a policy decision. So it's probably something that would be best put into, uh, you know, you know, your local MP. If you feel it's unfair, your local MP can bring that up with government uh, and ask why. Um, in terms of your question around what you're entitled to, obviously go to the, you know, the restart page will clarify what, if any, uh, part of the leisure hospitality grant you get access to for that half of the business that's had to be closed yeah they're, they're telling me that i'm not and, and I've, i have written to them and try and ask for clarity because all the other grants have now closed okay what we'll do is after this i'll point you in the direction of the trade associations relevant to you and, and that's really it's better getting your trade body to argue those points these are national issues yeah so your trade body is going to be better placed to art make those arguments on your sector's behalf um, in terms of and what was the other question around? It was, it was really what I should put in place, what measures I should put in place for yes, because um, you've got children contact it, yeah. within a retail. Yeah, so you you're talking about um, sort of parties or uh, classes that you will uh, give to, uh, to what 10, 15 kids in a, yeah. in, a in a small space. Yeah. And what do you need to do? Well, close contact guidance will have a lot of relevant information in there. Um, you don't need to be two meters away. Remember, it's, it's one meter plus mitigation. So you can be one meter away as long as you're doing the other things to mitigate the risk, which are good ventilation. That's a priority. Um, it might be face coverings uh, or visors. Um, or and then those not being available, you're then thinking screens. Um, yeah. but screens don't limit the tiny aerosol, uh, sort of, um, movement of tiny aerosol. So, ventilation is important. The follow up information you might have missed it, as you said, because you had to deal with the customer. You're going to get more detailed info within the week, it's 10 days tops, that talks about ventilation, uh, what is good ventilation, uh ways to think about it and increase it in that premise so hopefully that will you know give you the detail that that you are looking for another okay. thing is also context you have to bear in mind that children are uh, what age well we it could about? be a, and it could be anything from three upwards three until roughly um, what's your average maximum age well the children three to uh, 14 and the adults any age Okay, so there is a there's a big difference between I think it's under eleven or under thirteen. Again, we can check and tell you those are deemed you know neg negligible risk uh, in terms of picking it up and or transmitting it. And then once you get above that age of twelve or thirteen, that's when uh, the scientists said there's a an in, a higher risk. So that again will factor in. You know, because you it's down to you to do a risk assessment and it needs to be based upon the context of everything, age, ventilation, setup, pinch points. But those are some factors that you would consider. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. OK. Any other people got their hand raised? Uh, and meanwhile, whilst we're doing that, I will start to go through the other qu uh, questions we've got in the chat. 
Does air temperature have any bearing on transmission? Uh, so, well, this is, you know, coronavirus is from a similar family as, you know, as, uh, uh, common cold. You know, you remember government were concerned about winter. The reason is because colder temperatures uh, have, uh, have an effect, uh, make it easier for, for these viruses to be in an environment they like when they're breathed in and lie in your chest. So temperature has, uh, temperature and humidity have been shown to have some sort of effect. But in a typical premise, you it's the, the difference or the impact to changing temperature and, and, and humidity is going to be so negligible in comparison with changing ventilation. You know, it's a, a huge difference. So I would not concern yourself with trying to tweak uh, temperature or, or, or uh, humidity uh, too much. Um, the Obviously, you will need to think about temperature in terms of, at the moment, we're going through a bit of a cold spell. So we're telling you, you need to open up your windows or doors, possibly. And at the same time, you're trying to heat up a premise. Well, that might be what's on your mind. You don't need to be concerned about having heaters uh, as a way of keeping your premise comfortable for your customers uh, as a kind of counter to having all your windows and doors open. So is that worth a quick you know, concern? Hopefully that's answer that. If not, you know, please, uh, you know, ask again in the chat. Um, we've got, Facebook, sorry. Sorry, we've got Tony Lindsay with his hand up. I've just asked you to unmute. Okay. Tony, over to you. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to reiterate that bit that you were mentioning there, Paul. There is a connection between temperature and transmissibility because of the way the virus uses water droplets as the vector and yes. the, the higher the temperature the greater the humidity if you've ever been in a hot steamy shower you'll know what i mean um although in retail that's going to be a less of an issue but yeah i think your comment about watch your temperatures absolutely right but also maintain your ventilation flow um you know and if you get that right then you know you've done all that's reasonably possible and just get on with your life and make money Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The, I mean, we, we, with all this, I remember when I was doing these back in July, uh, I think we've read the similar studies uh, that were looking at humidity uh, and what they were finding, because bear in mind the virus is held within an aerosol, which is, you know, a small water droplet. So they're talking about how if you have higher humidity in your premise, it will allow the droplets to be heavier and therefore drop quicker to the floor. Uh, and that would that would make a difference. But now, while these things scientifically are factual, um, you know, in terms of all I'd say is I wouldn't uh, focus too much of your attention on those things. The most critical thing with an airborne virus, now we know it's transmitted more easily by people talking and uh, and breathing and these smaller particles, is to really focus on ventilation. Uh, the same with the cleaning, you know, at the beginning, um, we had certain studies that said, oh, it can be live for three days. Now we know that, uh, you know, for the, for the reasons I gave at the beginning of the presentation, that excessive cleaning is not where we should focus our attention. Normal cleaning is important for hygiene and, uh, and keeping uh, bacteria levels low, but we should focus more on ventilation less on, on cleaning. In terms of, obviously you're trying to get on and run a business, you only got so much time in your day uh, to focus on these measures. So in terms of where you prioritize your time, energy, policies, training, ventilation first, these other things uh, afterwards. So next one, face coverings, uh, Pfizer's, some large retail units will need to consider how the ventilation can be increased at the back of the units that may be a long way from the front doors. Uh, so, you know, bear in mind what I said, air con, um, you can have some large retail units might have air conditioning at, uh, throughout the premise. So although they're far away from the windows and doors, 
you could use air con as long as it's recirculating fresh air. It doesn't need to be 100% fresh air. The detail is included in the follow-up on that. But if you have no air con units and you struggle to get uh, fresh air towards the back of the premise, just think about all the ways that you can circulate the air, yeah? By bringing in fans or, um, um, I, I, again, to give some, con there's no hard and fast rules for this, but the, you know, the, I can only give you context to try and better understand what the, the, the scientific experts are saying and, and help you understand what, if anything, you should do in your place. So in terms of ventilation, one of the things Sage said in terms of offices is, uh, you know, typical offices, you might not be able to open all the windows or it might not be uh, easy to do it in colder environments. So they were talking about opening windows for 10 minutes every hour uh, and staff use that time to go away from the desk and do something else uh, potentially. So they were thinking 10 minutes every hour is, uh, is where they thought was uh, kept risk low in an office environment. But obviously that is very different. That's where people are sitting around for seven hours a day, not wearing face coverings. In the context of retail, the risk is very low. Sage gave advice looking at the level of risk and because people spend a small amount of time in that kind of place, uh, two, they're being encouraged to wear face coverings. And, you know, hopefully you've got some sort of vent level of ventilation. The level of risk is very low. You know, it's very different to some of the other sectors where, like offices, no masks, or like gyms where people are breathing out and don't have an option to wear face coverings. So you should, whilst you need to have measures in place, um, you know, look at the information, the whole, to see what is reasonable for your kind of setup. Um, how can you check if someone is exempt from wearing a face covering? We keep getting asked this question. You have to just take the word for it. Um, because of discrimination laws, you know, you can't have a policy where you insist somebody proves that they have some medical uh, reason not to wear a face covering you um, um, uh, but also whilst we can understand you have a concern there's a fear um, bear in mind the context you know we've I like you have <laughs> been subjected to a year uh, or, or more of fear and what we see in in the news about all you know the death number of deaths but for most people uh, that catch the virus, the risk of serious illness is very limited, you know, less than 0.02% or, percent or something of the under 70s that have no underlying conditions. So you will have the odd customer that comes in without a face covering, but you are minimizing the risk in several ways. You've got ventilation, uh, everybody else is wearing face coverings, uh, and, and which do offer depending on the material, some protection to the wearer, potentially. More info and detail on the follow-up that gets sent around. So uh, yes, you need to have process in place, but uh, just kind of put the concern in kind of the context of everything we now know. Uh, uh, you know, the, the science has evolved uh, a year on. You did not have uh, to take the word for it. Yeah, this is a good idea. This is something we've been mentioning for a long time is that, you know, um, lots of people are wearing the face coverings and they will look at staff or other customers that aren't wearing face coverings and kind of question, and there might be conflict within the premise. That's something you want to avoid. So, uh, you know, you're, any staff that have a reason not to wear a face covering, but you're encouraged to wear a badge. Yeah, and, and that makes it clear um, that they are exempt and avoids less risk of uh, confrontation. Oh, Paul, I think we'd just go back to Tony, who's got his hand up. Yes, Tony? Um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, I, I guess it that you're not legal, uh, opinion, can't give legal opinion and all that sort of malarkey. Um, in the context of exemptions and face masks, in your view, bearing in mind you're representing three local authorities, what, could it be construed as discriminatory if somebody rocks up at a, a, a shop, for example, supermarket, who says, yeah, I'm exempt, um, 
uh, and you go, yeah, that's fine. You can come in, but I'd like to take your details, please. Um, is could that be construed as discriminatory, or how so, how could it be handled? So, so what government it made the government's made clear in the guidance, and also you you may have seen there's been uh, different ministers and, and government officials talk around this exemption because we everybody knows. You know, if you create this rule saying this is we're being encouraged to do this to keep people safe, but you've got this uh, exemption, naturally all these concerns and queries come up. Uh, and they were saying we, you know, there is a risk uh, of discrimination if uh, com companies have policies that either say you can't come in if you're not wearing a face covering or uh, they thought that there might be a risk. So this is, you know, this is not my opinion. This was government's officials. This is why their guidance says um, you cannot, as, a, as a, a, a business, ask or demand customers prove they have an exemption. Because not everybody will feel comfortable. Bear in mind, it's not always physical. Some people might have an anxiety to having something over their, uh, their face. And we all know that most you know, especially men, 40% of men will not tell even their partner about a mental health condition. So they're not going to tell you as a business owner that they have a mental condition that it means they don't want to wear a face covering. So it's because of the, all those reasons that um, government, both legal and, um, you know, the ethical questions of forcing someone to have to disclose why they're not wearing it. So to your question about is it okay to work to record those uh, person's details, I'm not sure what purpose there would be to that. You know, what are you going to do with that data? That then gets you into other legal questions about data protection. You have to, there has to be good reasons why you collect data. There has to then be good reasons why you um, keep certain data. So I, I cannot see a good kind of legal reason to keeping that data. It, it doesn't kind of move um, you forward in any way. Um, can, and hopefully that's answered that uh, question, can fit and rooms be open? Yes, we answered that one. Um, they're fine. Is there any new guideline for how many people should be in a space at any one time? Uh, so again, this was, uh, you know, a question that came up, you know, a year ago when everything was new and, uh, and we were thinking about uh, this question in different contexts. Um, so there is no uh, there is no law that says how many people can fit in a space. Each business has to do their own risk assessment. Now, in the context of retail, a risk assessment for uh, a large business that has no ventilation at all um, might have more measures listed down to keep people safe, uh, which includes how many people fit in that on poorly ventilated area. So, sorry, I'm not saying that right. You can't have a hard and fast rule, and this is one example. You might have a large premise where you could physically fit in 100 people, yeah? You've got two different premises. One, you can fit 100 people in. Small store, you can fit 20 people in. If that bigger place is poorly ventilated and you've got no way of improving the ventilation, the number of people you might want to squeeze into that space might be uh, proportionally a lot, lot less than no, the number of people you want to fit into that small store because we know ventilation is, is so important. Now this gets to the other thing that's been happening for, for a long time is around, uh, you know, there's more and more retailers uh, making customers queue for a long time outside. And I completely understand why that is. Uh, because first of all, we were told everybody needs to be two meters apart, then everybody needs to be one meter apart, but with mitigation factors. And it's clear, you know, a year on from the questions that we get from different businesses, still a lot of confusion around mitigation and how does that change the rules around one meter, two meters, which obviously is a factor in deciding how many people can you squeeze into a space. So in um, when we're talking about risk, um, uh, again, no hard and fast rule on time, but the, the uh, you know, track and trace, uh, 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 NHS track and trace, are only interested in talking to somebody uh, that's been in contact with somebody with a virus if they were 
in a you know near that person face to face situation less than two meters away and you're not haven't got screens or uh, face coverings uh, on both parties there isn't uh, pp on both parties so in a, in mo many um, businesses uh, many retail sectors customers may just be in for 15 20 minutes and they're wearing face coverings and it's a, a good ventilated area and so there uh, there may not be the need uh, in a small shop to have two or three people standing outside for 10 minutes while you've got a few other customers inside browsing. You know, you could have people inside your premise that are one meter plus away from each other as long as you've looked at ventilation and those other risk mitigation uh, factors we spoke about. So one meter plus is, should be your focus and that will hopefully educate you and inform your policy about how many people can I get in my shop? How many do I need to force to wait outdoors? Do we have to wash down changing rooms after every customer? Uh, again, that, that was never a legal requirement. The initial guidance when you know science was still involved, uh, uh, talked about thinking about uh, uh, cleaning uh, uh, materials, cleaning changing rooms, cleaning uh, quarantining clothes. That was when less uh, there was less knowledge about vomit and surface transmission. We now know, as I said, it, that is virtually impossible. It's extremely unlikely because of the reasons I gave earlier. Uh, and therefore you wouldn't need to get washing down change rooms after every customer. You would have normal cleaning processes that you did you, that you had pre uh, pre pandemic uh, situation. And you factor that into your risk assessment. How often is reasonable to clean? But as I said, focus on ventilation. Excessive cleaning is not necessary. Excessive cleaning is only necessary if surface transmission was, uh, you know, a, a reasonable risk. The scientists are saying that's not the case. Again, you get the, the detailed information of what gets sent through. Um, yeah, and it looks like one of my colleagues has already answered that. Yeah, regular cleaning of contact points is still important. So doing your normal cleaning of door handles, all those things, perfectly normal hygienic processes. Because COVID isn't the only, uh, you know, bacteria, uh, 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 sorry, concern, hygiene concern out there. You just have your normal cleaning processes. If I had toiletries in my shop, can customers use testers? Um, if they've used anti-gel uh, first. So this is and a similar question. I've, I've got hand cream testers in our shop. Can customers use this if they've used hand gel first? So um, as I say, that what you're talking about there is uh, risk through surface, through touching, different customers touching those, hand, those testers, those toiletries. So the same uh, cleaning regime that you had pre-COVID should be in use. It may be that you clean those daily. It may be that you clean those every uh, every hour or so, whatever was in place previously. You um, do not need to have excessive cleaning. Uh, and that would be the same with antibacterial gels. If you use them before in the context of toiletries, fine. You do need to think about um, I can't imagine for testers, uh, um, look at toiletries, obviously a wide uh, number of products. Hand cream's fine, you take it out of the, the jar and it goes on your hand. But you would have to be thinking uh, maybe differently if you have testers for, uh, I mean, somebody tell me, would you have lipsticks, would you have eyeliners, things that get closer to the eyes, nasal cavities, mouth, those things, if they were acceptable before, you might need to think twice about. Okay, next question is... Uh, yes, obviously we're going to try and answer all these questions as we can. 
you might have questions that come to you after this event by all means email them to us at the food and safety at merchant.gov.uk uh, email if you're we cover the three boroughs so if you are watching this online and you're based outside Wandsworth, Richmond or Merton council areas you don't pay your can your taxes to those authorities please contact your own local authority environment health department and they'll be able to uh, give you further advice. And uh, does air conditioning system on or air purifiers help? Uh, so I think I've, I picked up the air conditioning question earlier. Hopefully that's answered that. In terms of air purifiers, this is again one of the products which we've seen uh, frauds online. So air purifiers, you know, are all, would only be useful if there were HEPA air filtration uh, because they offer something like 99.95% uh, filtration against um, virus sized particles uh, because they, the filters need to be so uh, good uh, and be made in a certain way that they block these very, very tiny particles. Otherwise, the particles just go through your air purifier. So it would have to be HEPA. You have to make sure that you are actually buying a HEPA uh, so, uh, filter. Unfortunately, there's a lot of products that are misdescribed. So please go to the likes of Witch or some other independent body that's tested the brand that, that you're thinking about buying. HEPA filters uh, can play a role in purifying the air. Uh, that's what airlines use because naturally they can't open windows and doors. However, um, you know, unless you're talking uh, high grade commercial, large air purifiers, they may not uh, sufficiently circulate the air enough to be of use. So you really need to look at the um, specification. It will tell you things like this is suitable for 10 square meter, 60 square meter space. There's no point having a large premise and having an air purifier in there because all it will do is it will just clean the air you know within a few meters around that particular purifier if it's not a decent one so uh, hopefully that's picked that up um if you've got access the person that's answering asking that if you've got the ability just to open windows and doors that is you know that can be sufficient for many premises so air uh what I want you to get across is if you've got a, a small retailer where you can get fresh air in by opening a window or door, that is uh, an air purifier is not uh, somehow superior to that. Yeah, it's all about uh, diluting, uh, bringing in fresh air supply into the premise. And what that does is even if you've got somebody uh, in your premise that's breathing out virus particles, it will be diluted to such an extent that um, the other people uh, don't breathe it in at all or breathe in so little it is of no risk. And obviously after so much time, the whole air gets um, recirculated, not recirculated, it gets replaced by fresh air. The detail of this in terms of um, what settings you need to have in aircon units, that will be in the follow-up information because that gets a bit too detailed here. Um, in terms of the concern about air car units can be a hazard rather than helpful, that uh, again goes into detail, but that's essentially th around the concern that's uh, out there about you cannot use an air car unit that is just recirculating the air. Some units only recirculate existing air, that does nothing to in terms of risk of reduction from aerosols. Um, I think that is all the questions we had in the chat. Is there any uh, final questions uh, from anyone? If anybody wants to raise the hand or final questions for anybody. So whether that's from a regulators or economic uh, uh, development teams in terms of the, um, the support side, anything we've spoke about or related to what we've discussed. Um, no questions from me, but just uh, I've put the food and safety at merton.gov.uk email in the chat. 
So if you do have any queries that you think of tonight or in a couple of days time, don't hesitate to contact us. We are here to help you at the first instance. So um, I primarily cover the London Borough of Wandsworth, but uh, my colleagues, you might have come across Sean Case in Richmond or Maria Dane in Merton. Um, our, um, one of our main parts of our job is to help businesses with reopening. Um, so please don't hesitate to contact us. Yeah, I, I'll just echo what Ravina was saying. I said it right at the start of the slides. You know, we uh, not everybody's come in contact with regulators before, uh, unfortunately, due to certain stories in the press over the years. Some businesses have this uh, incorrect impression that we are the kind of business police. That's far from the truth. We are there to help businesses understand the rules, give you guys practical advice, do the right thing. Yes, enforcement action does happen, but that is really for, and this is in the widest context, not just COVID. This is for any law we enforce. Uh, enforcement action is really the last resort. This is for businesses that are refu you know, adamantly refusing to follow the advice and not do the right thing to, to safeguard themselves, their staff, their customers. So, you know, if you've got a concern, uh, give us a call. If you see uh, somebody in your industry, you know, we do do proactive work, but we don't get, get around everywhere. If you see anybody in your industry or another sector that uh, seems to blatantly not be doing the right thing to pr protect customers and staff, let us know. We'll go and advise them uh, and give them every opportunity to, you know, to, to put things right. So, yeah, please do give us a call if you've got concerns or queries. All right, I'm going to finish it up there. Thank you to, to Rina for helping us out and, and my other colleagues for on the call. Uh, and hopefully that's made all this government rules and guidance, uh, hopefully the context has made it um, a bit more helpful to understand what, what you guys need to do. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Thank Bye. you.